Hey everybody, it's Josh Dorkin from BiggerPockets.com. Got another great interview here with Kevin Emolch of Pine Financial. Uh, it's PineFinancialGroup.com. And uh, Kevin can be found on BiggerPockets at BiggerPockets.com slash users slash Kevin Emolch. How's it going, Kevin? Nice to meet you. Yeah, it's good to meet you. It's nice to finally talk to you. Yeah, it's been... Uh, it's been a little while since we've been interacting on BP and by email, but uh, it's definitely great to finally get the face-to-face. -face. Yeah, it's almost like I'm actually meeting you. It's fun. There you go. Virtual hug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, man. So I you know, definitely wanted to talk to you for a couple of reasons. First off, you're a 10-year vet investor from what I understand. And uh, secondly, you are also a hard money lender. So um, I definitely want to hit you up on, on both topics. So let, let's start, I guess, with, with your investing. Um, 10 years, what, uh, what have you been doing? What's, what's the focus? How'd you start? Well, as you can see, I'm still pretty young. So I was, uh, went into the military right out of high school, and I was saving some money. You know, there, you don't make a lot of money in the military, but you don't <laughs> spend it either. Right. Like food paid for and right. room and board paid for. So I saw my bank account slowly but surely increasing and I wanted to do something with it. So I started reading books, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, some of these other things and everything points to real estate as a great investment. Right. So I focused my energy on, on learning real estate investing and I bought my first house. I was 20 years old, moved into it right, right out of the military, got some roommates, helped me pay my rent or my mortgage. Sure. Lived there for two years, moved out, and kept it as a rental. And voila, I was a real estate investor, 22 years old, owned two houses, and, and one of them was a rental. Wow. And from there, I really focused on alternative strategies. How can I acquire much, much faster than one every two years? I did continue to move every two years and buy more and more rentals that way. But then I learned how to use owner financing techniques, you know, lease options, subject tos, and things like that quickly turned into a full-time investor and, and was buying about a property a month and did that for several years. Uh, kept almost everything. I did some wholesaling and some flipping also, but I really was trying to build a portfolio. And I had about 35 houses when I started to to downgrade. And I'm actually working my way back up now, but it's it's about 22 houses that I have now. Most of them are, are owner-financed. Okay, great, great. Interesting. So you've uh, you've pretty much run the gamut of of uh, investing. Huh? It sounds like if there's a technique, if there's a strategy, you uh, you probably tried it out. I, it feels that way. You know, there's always something. I haven't bought at the auctions yet, but okay. it feels like a lot. I've done a lot in the business. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, twenty I man, twenty years old buying your first house. That's very impressive. That's great. Yeah. FHA is a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and also, I mean, you know, speaking to what you were talking about, you said, look, you're in the military, your expenses were low, you know, you saw your, your cash start to creep up and you want, wanted to know what to do with it. I, I think a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of folks in the military, I think, are in that same situation and I think it really is a good opportunity for, for those people. Um, but, but even um, non-military non folks, I, I think it speaks a lot to how they should think about things, you know, keep your expenses down and, uh, and save up your cash so you can start picking up some properties. Yeah, I agree. And, and I learned very quickly, you don't need cash to pick up properties. You know, this, the property I moved out of when I moved into my next home, that first one, I, I used student loans to help rehab that property before I moved into it. So, I mean, there's lots of different creative ways to come up with the money to do your investing. Sure. Owner financing is one, but there's money out there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wh why don't you, uh, as, as somebody who's done quite a few owner financing deals, I guess kind of give, give us the, uh, you know, what's the lowdown? How does, you know, uh, tell us what an owner financing deal looks like in, in two minutes or less. Yeah, absolutely. The, the key is to find a seller that's extremely motivated, someone who needs to get out of their property. And, and usually these are little or, or low equity, little to no equity deals, and they don't they don't need cash to get out of the property. What they need is some relief from that payment. Yeah. So we'll, we'll come in and lease the property for the payment amount or take the deed for the payment amount and just uh, not assume the loan but take over the responsibility for the loan. Um, not formally but informally be responsible for sure. it. Sure. And you, uh, I, I guess, um, how, how would somebody approach or, or find those those folks who are um, 
potential owner finance, um, I guess, deal makers, right? How would you find somebody who's looking to, uh, you know, soften their, their financial burden, so to speak? It's find the actual seller that's willing to do yep. that. Yep. Yeah. You know, that's a <clears throat> good question, Josh, and I'm actually looking for bird dogs right now, so it's funny that you bring that up because we're going to start teaching, I'm starting to teach some classes on, on how to find these people to um, either for themselves or to help bird dog for me and, and earn some money that way. Sure. But really the key is to, is to actually knock on doors as, as I think is the best way to do it. And there's a couple of different lists that you can go drive around and knock on these doors, but the foreclosure list is, is the, the obvious one. Yeah someone's falling a little bit behind on their payments and they're going to lose their house, they're probably pretty motivated. Sure. If you have the ability to make up the back payments and take over the payments and cash flow of the house, it's just a, it's a easy opportunity to buy property that way, I think. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, what would you say of all these different techniques that you've, you've played around with? Um, I, I'm guessing owner financing is, is clearly your favorite. Yeah. Uh, in a market that we're in right now in Denver, I actually like to use harder private money to acquire rehab and then refinance with credit partners okay. to permanent finance because now I got really low, uh, how do I say this, high equity deals. There's lots of equity in these deals and it cash flows better. Okay. Um, but if you're worried about qualifying for loans or can't find credit partners, an easy, easy way into the business is definitely owner financing. Sure, sure. Um, what about wholesaling? You said you've done a couple of wholesale deals. Uh, how were those for you? I think they're hard. Yeah. I think that the you know I can only speak about Denver because that's the market I'm in. Sure. But the the flip market is getting pretty thin. Okay. Uh, so the when I say that I mean the wholesale prices are coming up, but the retail prices are staying about the same. Yeah. So as the flipper or the rehabber's margins get thin, there's not a whole lot of room for the wholesaling. Right. Now, I don't want to discourage somebody. I still think it's a, it's a great opportunity. You don't need cash. You don't need credit. All you need is a lot of time right. and motivation. Sure. Um, but it, 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 different markets, it's going to be easier in, I, I guess I would say. Okay. And, and you know, I, I think a lot of people say you know, wholesaling is probably the first, uh, is, is how you should start or bird dogging, helping somebody find deals. But, what a lot of folks will do is they'll go out and they'll say, hey, you know, look, uh, wholesaling's cake. You know, it's just find a property and flip it off to somebody. And, you know, in five, five minutes you, you make 5000 bucks, and, you know, it's cake. Real estate investing is easy, 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 right? I mean, what, <laughs> what, t tell us what's, you know, the real deal, seriously. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard. When I was when I was really buying a lot of properties, I would spend about $1,000 a month on my marketing, generate a bunch of calls. I'd go out on maybe 10 different appointments where I sat down with sellers and I bought one property in every 10 living rooms I sat in. Yeah. So that's a lot and yeah. it, it does take a lot of work. Now when you say wholesaling, you're probably referring to buying steep discount properties, flipping it to a, a rehabber that's going to fix it up and resell it for a profit. You know, you could wholesale more than just discounted properties. I would love for people to get subject to or lease option properties under contract and then flip them to me for a same same wholesale fee three to five grand yeah that's the kind of deal i want interesting interesting all right now what about uh, buy and hold obviously you know you're you're doing some some form of landlording there as, as well um what would be um i guess what's what's your best uh, best snippet of advice for uh one of you landlords or, or even folks who are, you know, I guess slightly newer in the business. Yeah, I've got 10 years of landlord experience, lots of tenant months, I guess you would call them. So right, I can right. go on this all day. Sure. But <clears throat> really the key, if you're talking about a specific key, it's finding the right property and then having the right tenant. Yeah. Uh, the, the tenant screening is, is crucial. And I'll tell you this, it's a hell of a lot easier to manage a property that's empty than to have a bad tenant. Oh, yeah. Oh, no yeah. tenant's better than a bad tenant. And I've fallen into this mistake time and time and time again. Yeah. Get motivated. Got to get a prop, my, my payment covered. I got to get a tenant in there. I just yeah. throw the first one, the first tenant in there that applies, and it turns into a disaster. Yeah. And your house of calls, cards can fall very quickly with the wrong tenant. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I've, I've been there. <laughs> I've been there, done that, suffered through it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think, you know, there's – you know what's the big saying? If if you uh, if you're afraid to boot somebody on Christmas, don't be a landlord. 
Yeah. And uh, if you're so desperate that you can't sit with an empty property for months while you're trying to find a quality tenant, don't be a landlord. That's right. And so many people start in this business wanting to be a landlord and they'd have no money. Yeah. That's why you should wholesale yeah. or bird dog and get some cash. Yeah. You know, it's not that bad to be a realtor either. I've never gotten my license. I think it was a detriment to what I was doing. But I don't think having a license is bad and yeah. you could generate some cash that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Get up your savings account and then become a landlord and start yeah. thinking about your wealth. Pay your bills and then become wealthy. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, you know I think a, a lot of people don't realize also that being a being a buy and hold investor or landlord is is it's not cheap. It's not just about having enough money to scratch by. You know, roofs roofs do need to be replaced. Boilers yeah. go out and and things happen. You really you do need that cash pot ready uh ready and available if if you're going to be a landlord. Yeah, it's great for long term, but it's hard to pay bills as a landlord. Yep. Absolutely. All right, man. Let's let's get into this hard money stuff. You're uh, you're a hard money lender. The uh, the press calls guys like you sharks. Some other uh, investors call you guys worse words. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, you know, clearly hard money lenders play a necessary role in the real estate investing space. Um, there's there's a fair amount of you guys around the country, and um, uh, I, I guess what what. I want to know, and I think what other people want to know is, you know, how does it work, right? As 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 a hard money lender, what what does your day look like? Um, how many deals do you look at? You know, what are your tips, so on and so forth. We'll get into it, but you know, kick it off here. Yeah, let's start by talking about <clears throat> hard money itself, and it, and it's very expensive. If you don't know, hard money is you're going to be paying four to five points generally, and that's one point is one percent of the loan amount and origination fee. Your, your interest rates are going to be 12 to 18, something like that. So it's it's not cheap, but it's yep. a little bit painful, um, especially if they require a monthly pay, payment. Yep. Uh, I think a monthly payment is fantastic because it puts pressure on you to get your project done. Right. So uh, Investors hate it, but I think it's a necessary evil for success. Sure. Uh, but hard money is a tool. So well, if you can uses, understand... I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but, but who uses hard money first off, right? The savvy real estate investor uses hard money. Well, I mean, we're not talking a land landlord. A guy who owns a property isn't going to go out and just get hard money because he needs cash for you know repairs or whatnot. It's it's going to be somebody else, right? Who is it? But the landlord will use hard money to acquire more property very quickly. Sure. Here's what I, I'm sure you've heard this, but there's a lot of people buying property with hard money right now, rehabbing it, getting in with zero money down, and then refinance it into a conventional loan. You can go up to ten properties with Fannie and Freddie. Right. So if you're not using 20% down payments and you're not having to pay for your own rehab, can you do more deals? Can you acquire a portfolio much faster? Right. Yes. Now, are you going to pay for that? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But if you're able to acquire more property, your properties are going to absorb some of that fees, right. or most of those fees, and it makes it worth it. Yeah. That's what I'm saying about hard money. It's just a tool. So if you can understand it as a tool and we're not raping anybody. Right. Then, then use it or don't use it. Yeah. Well, nobody's forcing anybody to use hard money. I mean, that's the bottom line. If you, you know, yeah. if you think, if you if you want to curse and call you guys bad names, well, it's your own fault that you don't have the cash available to do what you want to do. And if you don't, well, then there are sources, there are alternatives. But of course, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you a little bit of money because clearly you take on some risk. And tell yeah. us about that risk. Hey, well, you let me actually back up just a second. You would be surprised at how many of our clients actually do have a significant amount of money. Oh, well, sure. It's and it, because they understand that using leverage will increase your rates of returns. That's what they're after. They're not. We don't loan to just people that have no money or right. just people who have bad credit. Can we fit those people into our product? Probably. Sure. You know, if you don't, if you have bad credit. Maybe this is a good product for you, but it's not just that. No, no, I, I misspoke by saying that. I mean, I there are many, many wealthy people use hard money. Uh, I know quite a few guys who are uh, doing quite well who use it. Uh, but yeah, you know, clearly, most of their money is tied up, which which is one of the primary reasons that that you know they they go that angle. Uh, Absolutely. So, yeah. And I think I, I knew you weren't. You didn't misspeak, but I think people out there have a misconception of what it is, and I think it's important to understand that it's not just for people that are really high risk. Right, right. Um, so tell us, I mean, tell us about the risk. I mean, as as a as a hard money guy, you know, 
I'm, I come in, I'm some, you know, I'm Joe Investor. I find a deal. I say, hey, Kevin, you know, I got this awesome deal. Check this out, man. These numbers are so exciting. Man. Just got home from some, some study course and, <laughs> and this is going to be awesome. They told me I just have to come to you and, and, and show you a deal. And then with no money down, suddenly I'm tied in, I'm flipping it and I'm making millions, right? What? That's not really what it's like, is it? Yeah, well, let's take a look at that. So, <laughs> that call, which happens, I don't know, four or five times every day. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, we'll take a look at you first. So, I want to see your financial position, and and if it's bad, it might still work if the deal's really strong, or we could bring in a partner or someone else to help you out. But I want to see primarily that you have a little bit of reserves. We talked about this with the rental properties. It's the same thing with flips or anything else that you're doing. You need to have sufficient money in the bank to handle problems. So we're going to look at that first, and then I'm going to look at your deal. I want to know what it's, what you're buying it for, what you think it's worth after it's all fixed up, and what your repairs are going to be. <clears throat> You'd be surprised how many times I get these great deals, 50, 60 cents on the dollar come across my desk, but there's no repair money. Right. There's no figure for the repairs. That's an essential variable to yeah. determine if the deal is good or not. Absolutely. So I'm really looking at those three numbers, and if I think it's strong, we'll run it by our appraiser, get a desk review. If it's strong, we're probably going to close. Gotcha, gotcha. Now you guys lend. You guys lend in Colorado, correct? Yeah, we're up and down the Front Range, so from Fort Collins down to Colorado Springs. Gotcha. Now tell me, um, why is it? Why aren't you lending in, in Des Moines? Why aren't you lending in, in Manhattan? Why are you know why why specifically Colorado? You know, why, why do lenders traditionally stay local? Well, you want to be able to touch the asset. Yeah. You know, a lot of, some of the money is my money, but most of it is privately raised. We've got about $15 million. I've never lost a penny. I really want my investors to, to stay happy. Now, we've had some defaults, sure. but most of them work out just like they're supposed to. And the reason for that is we're extra careful with the origination and the servicing. Part of the origination is going out and look at the property. Right. I'm going to see it. I want to see what repairs need to be done. I want to make sure that their budget accounts for the repairs that I think need to be done. So it's really, I guess this is a long answer, but really I want to be able to touch the asset. Sure. And and of 100 deals that come across your desk, how many of them do you touch? How many 100 deals come? How many do you actually physically go and check out? How many do you guys close on of, say, 100 properties? 100. We'll close on about 25 of those. Okay. And we'll go out and touch every one of those. Yeah. It's rare that we'll go out and look at a property and not close on it. Okay. Okay. So I don't go so, out until it's pretty sure we're going to close. Gotcha. Gotcha. And that, that was my follow up there. Great. Um, so as, as, as an investor who's thinking about potentially using hard money, um, I now go, I find a deal. I want to be prepared before I come in and, 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 and talk to you. What do I need to do? What do I need to bring? What do I need to have with me um, in order to, uh, besides a good deal, obviously, but, you know, do I need paperwork? What do I need to bring with me? What do I have to have in writing um, before we get this thing done? And, and how long does it take to close a deal? Yeah, and this is where every hard money lender is going to be different. Sure. So what I can tell you with me is I try to be as easy to work with as possible. So I want to qualify you first. Yeah. I'm going to pull the credit. Okay. I don't put a whole lot of weight on the credit unless you're telling me you're going to refinance it. But if you're going to flip it, I'll look at credit and I really want to see the reserves. I want to see at least six months of payments in the bank at a minimum. Okay. If you have that, then I'll, I'll provide you your loan commitment letter so you can go out and get your deal. Um, until you have a deal, there's not really a whole lot for us to talk about. Once you have the deal, send me the contract and your scope of work as detailed as you can. And, and I'll get started. You don't need to do anything else until you get an email from me with a list of the disclosures and documents I need to collect from you. Gotcha. So it's nothing that you have to have ready. It's really focusing on finding your deal. Great. Sounds easy. It's really easy. There you go. So, so then I can close in less than a week. We can close in three or four days. Great. Great. Now, look, it, so, it sounds great. And, and as, as we both know, hard money is, is a pretty fantastic tool. Um, now let let me let me flip the switch a little bit on you. Um, somebody says, yeah, you know, there's this guy Kevin who's who's a hard money Pine Financial Group, and you know they they'll they'll help you find your you know with the cash to to do your your flips. How do I know I can trust you? You know, how do I know that you're you're somebody safe to work with? Now I'm not obviously questioning you because by now <laughs> I've I've gotten enough references on you, but 
where where I I'm I'm pretty comfortable. But but you know, as somebody who who doesn't know you or somebody like you in their area, um, what kind of due diligence are they going to do? Um, what'll help them uh, ease their uh, worries? You know, that's a great question, Josh. And I, that's the first time I've actually been asked that question. But if I was a borrower, I would be. I would be nervous about this because generally your hard money lender is going to hold back some money for your repairs. So I want to know where is that money going from, going to, and where is it being held? If it's being commingled with all the hard money lenders' funds, which is what happens a lot of the time, I would have a real problem with that. It needs to be set aside in an account just for that project, so you know it's there when you're you go to request request your draw. It's your money. Right. So I would focus on where the money is being held, where the money's coming from. So I'd ask questions about that. You know, there's a lot of a lot of hard money lenders that use credit or debt, uh -huh. and those HELOCs, as you probably know, have been getting shut off, or any lines of credits have been getting shut off. Absolutely. So is your funding going to be there when you get to the closing table? Yeah. I don't know where the money is coming from, and I'd also focus on maybe a, a handful of uh, references. Sure. What would be your biggest red flag? Um, Possible, you know, I, I don't know, across the board and in, in, in looking at a hard money lender, for example, you know, what, what might raise, you know, get, get, get your ears buzzing a little bit. Uh, where's the money coming from? Is it all your money and are you committing to multiple people and, and it's really not there for me? Yeah. That would be the biggest red flag for me. I, I know there's a lot of individuals with $100,000 saying they're hard money lenders and committing to three or four different loans, they can't fund that. Right, right. Absolutely. Well, right. you know, if, if, in if, business or not. if they fold under the pressure of, of that question or don't want to answer it, maybe it's time to look elsewhere, right? Yeah, I, I think so. That's great. Uh, great advice, man. I, I think uh, I think a lot of this is going to come in really helpful for anybody who's, who's paying attention. I think we've got five people now watching each video, so... I, I think it's going to be exciting for all five of them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll be sure to log on there and watch my own videos. Yes. <laughs> no. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think we covered a lot. Is there is there anything else, you know, out, outside of the stuff that we've talked about that you, know, you might want to share with, with the folks who are watching? Is there any, um, you know, are there any tidbits or, you know, any stories that, that – you know, you think might be fun or anything you want to share, or if not, we, you know, I'll pick some out of your brain. Uh, and I could, like I said, I could just go on forever. And, and this, um, this landlording thing is, is coming up to my mind for some reason. Okay. But I, I think that the tenant screening is vital, and there's some tips that you could do with the tenant screening. And actually, I have some tips for um, actually getting tenants to show up to your appointments because how often do we go out to show a property and the tenant never even shows oh, up? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, All right, let's so, hear them. Well, let's start with that one. It's then. a top I, 10 list. <laughs> I would never go show a property unless the tenant called me at least one hour or no more than one hour before our appointment to confirm that they're going to be there. So if we're going to have an appointment at 2, they need to call me at 1 yeah. and say, I'm going to be there at 2. And they either need to leave a message or actually speak to me. If I don't get a phone call, I don't go out there. That's great. And <clears throat> I learned this the hard way, like a lot of us have. And I also like to set my showings with, First of all, I don't like to call them show showings. They're appointments so yep. that the people actually show up. And I want to make appointments with two or three different people all at the same time. And I love it. I think people are, are intimidated by that and they <laughs> get uncomfortable. And maybe oh, yeah. it is. If you, if you think it's going to be, it will be. But I have three tenants showing up to look at one of my properties. It's fantastic because now I have a, a competition for my property. And it doesn't have to look great. And I'm still going to demand a much higher rent. Absolutely. And you know what? My rent isn't even determined yet. I haven't priced my property. So which one of you guys want to pay me more for the rent? Right, right. And, and then I'll, I'm going to take that into consideration. That's great. Um, so that's a couple of, uh, couple of pieces of advice. But also on the, the tenant screening, I think you need to, to pull credit and criminal background. Absolutely. And I also like to do uh, check writing history. Yeah. Um, the criminal background, if I see any drug charges yeah. or domestic violence, it's a no immediately. Right. The drug charges will kill you. If you get a drug house, I'm telling you, oh, it's not good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I won't say I know, but maybe I do. <laughs> <laughs> you probably um, heard that. What? What? And you, you had mentioned something about uh, checks. Yeah, check writing history. I, uh, the, I haven't heard of the check writing history. So okay, so I, the the service that I use pulls the credit, the criminal background, the check writing history, and an eviction report. Sure. So the check writing history is is important because if they're out there writing bad checks, what are they going to do to you? Absolutely. And I'm going to. 
I'm very clear and very open with everybody. So if I see that and I decide to rent to them, I'm going to say, well, you know, normally I charge a $40 return check fee, but you obviously have a problem with this. So it's going to be an $80 return check fee or something that I think I could profit from. Right, right. Or you need to pay me either auto draft or certified funds or I'm not going to rent to you. They're not pulling punches. Don't mess with Kevin, right? <laughs> nice. I mean, we're just being, we're being clear and I'm providing you housing, but I don't want to be screwed like you've screwed these other people. Right, absolutely. Awesome, man. Listen, fantastic, fantastic advice. Lots of great info. We are pretty much out of time. So it was great. I think we should definitely try and do this again. I think we could probably get uh, you know, hours and hours of, uh, of Josh and Kevin time. So maybe, maybe we'll try um, or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to. I'm having fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, before I let you go, it's again, it's Pine Financial Group, pinefinancialgroup.com. Uh, Kevin Amolsh. And are you uh, you on Twitter, Facebook, anything like that that you want to share publicly? Or yeah, but I don't know how to use any of that stuff. So, <laughs> so don't worry. we don't really post. <laughs> but here's what I can tell you: we we do a lot of free classes. If you're in the Denver area, live classes. Um, and, and we we really try to educate our clients. And what I found is if you provide a lot of value, much like what you do, sure. people really appreciate that. And when they are ready to do business, they're going to do business with you. So that's why we give all this away for free. Great. And so it's just pinefinancialblog.com, which is our blog. And click on the free events tab and you'll see some of the things that we're doing. Perfect. Perfect. And, and of course, when you say you're going to come, please do show up. I, of course, blew Kevin off. Uh, and uh, I'm deeply, deeply apologetic for it. I will say it in front of everybody watching. I, I, I messed up. I'm sorry. Um, I appreciate that. And uh, again, it's uh, biggerpockets.com slash users slash Kevin Amolsch. And it's A-M-O-L-S-C-H. Kevin, it's been a pleasure, man. Yeah, Josh, it's been a lot of fun. All right. Take care. All right. Thanks.